Amen. You can be seated. I know. <laughs> That's right. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your kingdom today, Lord, and to, to, to delve into your word. I ask that you anoint my lips to bring forth the word for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Oh, you didn't check your calendars today. Today is actually Orthodox Easter. So, we get a two-for-one this year. For any of you that are confused, Easter... Have you ever wondered why Easter is always... Why Christmas is any day of the week. Fourth of July is any day of the week. Easter is always on a Sunday. Have you ever wondered why that? About that? Never wondered once, huh? Why it was always on a Sunday. Every other holiday in the world, when it commemorates a date falls on that date. Well, Easter is determined by being the first Sunday after the full moon, as is figured mathematically, after March 21st. So the Sunday following the full moon following March 21st is Easter Sunday. What does that have to do with Jesus raising, rising from the dead? Not a single thing. <laughs> but the Orthodox use a different calendar. Orthodox Christians in, uh, in Israel, in uh, Europe, Africa, the rest of the Middle East as well, use a different calendar. So for to them, today is Easter. So we get a second Easter message. As if the last one wasn't good enough, we get another one. Okay? Uh, but we're going to look at something a little bit different. I taught on something along these lines. It's been at least 10 years ago. But I thought about it again this week. And after I was told that because Bree skips church whenever she wants to, that I was preaching today, um, she just decided she's not going to come even when she's been asked to preach, you know. So we know that some people have priorities in line and some people don't. Yeah, but we'll, we're, we have to love her anyway, even though she's skipping school, so to speak. And I hope that Aaron is writing all this down and tells her as soon as he gets out of church today. <laughs> But I was thinking about this after, after Pastor Bob asked me to preach, and it's about... Now, many of you, well, all of you know that I married a smoking hot Catholic girl. And uh, that's what I did. That's what I chose to do. Maybe it was a uniform. I don't know. But uh, I married me a Catholic girl. So we are a blended family, so to speak, between Catholic and Protestant. And if you've ever had dinner with us, we actually do the Catholic prayer before we eat. The sign of the cross and everything. It's uh, for, for our family, it's a part of her family tradition, a part of her heritage, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. So we do it. Uh, and so, but we have a blended family, but I was always thought every time, remind me when I'd go to Mass, every time you go to a Catholic church, you'll see either in their courtyard or on their walls, they have something commemorating each station of the cross. And there was 14 stations of the cross according to the Catholic faith. Uh, the tradition holds, this is legend and partly, now look, I'm not here to say that there's not 14 stations of the cross, that any of the things that happened on the stations of the cross did or didn't happen. We have scriptural backing for all but five of them. And if you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, you've seen the Catholic stations of the cross because each one of those is highlighted in that film. But if you look around any Catholic church, you'll see those stations of the cross. And the legend has it that Mary, after Jesus uh, was crucified and rose from the dead and went back to heaven, Mary would retrace his steps throughout Jerusalem to, uh, to honor him and to remember him. And that's how it began. And then uh, there was a, a nun a long time ago, I can't remember her name now, she had a vision of Mary doing this and the legend holds that Mary con continued this tradition after she was uh, relocated to Ephesus, which is modern day Turkey. And that she would set up where she lived, the path, she had marked the number of steps in her head from each place to the next. And she retraced that at her new home in Ephesus, and she would commemorate each stop with either a stone memorial, or if there was a tree there, she would mark on the tree to commemorate which stop it was. And that's where we get the traditional stations of the cross. Now that number, 14, wasn't you know, set in stone, so to speak, until 1731 by Pope Clement XII who decided on the 14, and the 14 
are as follows. These are the Catholic Stations of the Cross. So a little bit of history lesson this morning, but then I'm going to show you something else that's really cool, okay? Now, like I said, I'm not here to confirm or deny that this nun had a vision of Mary retracing these steps or that these specific things occurred or didn't occur. It's not really important. But the Catholic Stations of the Cross are this. The first one is Christ is condemned. He's condemned to death. We find that in Mark 15. The second station is the cross is laid, uh, laid upon him to carry. We find that in John 19. Number three, he has his first fall. We have no scriptural reference for this, specifically saying that he fell. Uh, number four, we meet, he meets his mother along the road. Again, we have no scriptural reference for this. Uh, and now if you... If you've seen the movie, you can see these scenes play out in your head as we read them. Number five, Simon of Cyrene is, married to bear, is made to bear the cross. We find that in Luke 23, Mark 15, and Matthew 27. Number six, Christ's face is wiped by Veronica. Again, we have no scriptural reference for that one. He falls a second time. Again, no reference. Number eight, he meets the women of Jerusalem. We find this in Luke 23 also. Number nine, he falls for a third time. And again, no reference. Number 10, he's stripped of his garments. All four Gospels account for that. He is crucified. All four Gospels. He dies. All four Gospels. Number 13, his body's taken down from the cross. All four Gospels. And number 14, he is laid in the tomb. And once again, we find reference to in all four of the Gospels. Uh, I think the, the, those traditions, that may have happened. I think that the way the movie showed it is a very realistic way of what might have happened. I don't know what the significance would have been to the early church for the three times falling. But that's not to say it didn't happen, but we have to be real careful when we base our thinking on tradition and legend. It has to be confirmed in the word. But the idea of remembering each thing he did along that way is something I think has been lost in the Protestant church. We've taken from, we've gone from one extreme where the Catholic church definitely went to one extreme in terms of their iconography, um, their, 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 circumstance, their pomp and circumstance type of things, their uh, use of images, their use of tradition. And we've gone so far the other way to where we've thrown everything out. And to the point where most of the Catholic Church doesn't venerate Mary in any way, where she deserves some acclaim for what she was chosen to do. Imagine, I've, I've got four kids. I can't imagine knowing one of them will be sent to be sacrificed for everybody else. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine Phoenix knowing, looking at her now, that she was going to have to die for you. My thought, forget you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm being honest. If I have to choose between my daughter and Rob Folk, guess what? Bye-bye, Rob. <laughs> now, I, wouldn't, I mean, I would, I would miss him. I think, oh, that Rob... That Rob, he was a pretty nice guy. He was all right. Cubs fan, Bears fan, but see ya. <laughs> Carly. <laughs> but I couldn't imagine having to do that. So the idea that we don't give Mary enough, I think we do in this church, because I know mom's talked about her many times. But I think it's important still to remember some of those things that were a part of all of Christianity was under one roof for hundreds of years. This is part of our tradition too. Just because Luther nailed those theses to a door and decided to split off from the Catholic Church doesn't mean that we forget everything that was part of our shared cultural heritage as believers that came up until then. Now, obviously the indulgences, those things had to go. Um, if you don't know what indulgences are, they were you would pay to be able to go sin. Um, so you would pay a certain amount of money to the church and you would automatically be forgiven of a sin before you committed it. So if you saw that nice girl walking down the street and you wanted to, you know, pretend you were married for a night, you'd go see the priest and you'd pay him and he'd say, okay, go ahead and you're forgiven afterwards. That had to go. Obviously, that, had, that, that is no, no basis in scripture. Uh, I don't think that we have to go through a priest to speak to God, but I think uh, we should have authority over us. We, we, we agree with authority, right? We believe in divine order. Now, I don't think that saying a certain amount of Hail Marys or Our Fathers is any kind of a penance that is needed. I don't think you need a penance. Jesus paid all the penance back 2,000 years ago. That's what we celebrate during Easter week. But it's a reminder to ourselves that, hey, you know, actions have consequences. Whether you're forgiven or not, your sin has a consequence. Sin destroys, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. Sin brings death. Period. Now, we've been redeemed from the curse, but if I go out and cheat on my wife, I can be forgiven. 
I can still go to heaven, but that relationship we had before that moment will never be the same after that moment. That relationship has died. Now, if she ever chose to forgive me, it'd probably be easier for her to forgive me once I'm in the ground, but uh, <laughs> that relationship as it was dies that moment, right? Whether we're in forgiveness or not, sin brings death. The word says it very clear. So I think it's important to remember these things. It's important, even though we don't have the same traditions, but I think it's important to not throw everything out, which is why I've come up with a new Stations of the Cross. Okay? All scripture-based and all redemptive. Okay? Because I believe that the cross was an act of redemption. And everything he did on the way to the cross was an act of redemption. Every, there are seven places where Jesus shed his blood. Seven. Nice, perfect number, which is why Striper uses it on all their album covers. And this shows that they're more Christian than most Christians. They're more spiritually sound than... You know, John Michael Talbot, who's oh, 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 kind of singing. Uh, That's recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a dig at Pastor Bob. He, he and I have different musical tastes. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, we'll see who's better. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it up there one day. We'll just do a challenge. You can listen to Striper or John Michael Talbot, and then you tell me which one you want to spend a day listening to. All right? Do you, do you accept this challenge? Uh, you haven't heard John Michael Talbot, so. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, well. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I've gotten way off subject. <laughs> but uh, I have come up with, we, we know that Jesus Christ shed his blood in seven different places. In Gethsemane, uh, the bruises and internal bleeding from the beatings that he took, the whipping post, the crown of thorns, his pierced hands, his pierced feet, and his pierced side. Seven different places that Jesus shed his blood. Each one of those seven places represents a redemption that he bought us. And now we've continued on with, the, with, the, with that. Those are incorporated into these redemptive stations of the cross. And we're going to go through them now. The first one, Jesus prays alone in Gethsemane. And uh, that is a redemption of, our, of willpower. It's, he showed that it is possible to overcome your flesh and to submit your will to God the Father's. We, have, we see that in Luke 22. So flip over to Luke 22 with me, if you would. Luke 22. And we're going to look at verse 43, just for, to, for time's sake. We won't read the whole thing. Uh, but we know that, well, let's just read it. 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. We also have available to us the means to strengthen us in order to submit our will to God. Okay? Now remember, we don't have the rest of the New Testament without Jesus, right? You, that's safe to say? Paul's not writing the rest of the New Testament if he hadn't had his road to Damascus moment. Everything in the rest of the New Testament is based on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So we could say that everything after John is because of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Amen? It was paid for by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? Come on. I can't hear you. Right? Okay. Philippians 4.13. Who can recite it without looking? Is it already up there? Oh, <laughs> no, it's not up there. Okay. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, if you could have done it, why didn't you do it? He did it and he oh. was like, well, <laughs> I can do how many things? All through Christ who strengthens me. So we don't have to wait on the angels. Christ, is, Christ has already strengthened us. Angels are at our beck and command, but Christ has already given us the strength. It's Christ that strengthens us. Amen? Now, I think we've leveled up. Who strengthened Jesus? The angels. Okay? But who strengthens us? Jesus. I'd say that's leveling up. That is what the kids would say is a pro-gamer move. Am I wrong? Have we not leveled up? 
from having angels strengthen us to the Son of God himself who strengthens us? Doesn't he go before the Father on our behalf? Always? He presents himself, he's before the Father at all times on our behalf? On my behalf. Say, so don't, don't ignore that part, Father. Forget that. You didn't see that. That didn't happen. That's under the blood. Pay attention to this. This is what he's doing. Aren't you glad he does that for you too? Yes. Did you let, I have to do this now. <laughs> from time to time. Because <laughs> I can feel it tickling on my cheeks. I'm not used to it. So I'm halfway to hippie at this point. All I need is a, what is it, patchouli? <laughs> Some patchouli oil. <laughs> is that what it's called? Did I get it right? Come on, hippie. Did I get it right? <laughs> we can do all things because Christ has strengthened us and continues to, to speak on our behalf before the Father. To give us strength. When we pray for strength, we're getting it straight from the throne. We're not waiting for an angel to come minister to us. We don't have to, because angels can be delayed. We saw in Daniel that angels can be delayed. And we know that Jesus is ever seated at the right hand of the Father speaking on our behalf. So when he prayed alone in Gethsemane and proved that it was not his will, but God's be done, he showed us how to do that. We submit our will, not my will, but God's be done. Jesus is right there saying, that's what you need to see, Father. Power up. Amen? All right. Number two, the second station of the cross. Jesus is betrayed. Matthew 26, verse 46. Matthew 26 and verse 46. I'm in 27. That's wrong. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests, chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately... He went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. So Jesus was betrayed by someone who had been with him for roughly three and a half years. Now we know Judas was kind of a sketchy character. But I am of the opinion that we'll see Judas in heaven. I really do. Because after Jesus died, I personally believe that he emptied hell. And Judas died before Jesus. And I believe that Jesus emptied hell when he went down. This is to say he took the keys of hell and death and routed it. And so I believe Judas will be in heaven. And he'll be one of the happiest people you've ever met. Because Judas will be happy that his betrayal was covered under the same blood that covers my betrayal of Jesus. Of your betrayal of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We've all denied Christ at some point, in some way. Maybe we didn't sell him for 30 pieces of silver, but we've hidden our light away. We've all done it. Our ability to trust is what Jesus redeemed by his betrayal. We know Proverbs, it says, trust in the Lord. Numbers, it says, God is not a man. But let's go to Romans 3, 4. I'll give you those verses. If you write them down, you can write down Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Numbers 23, verse 19. But for the sake of time, we're going to skip over to Romans 3, verse 4. Says, uh, well, let's back up because uh, we're coming in mid-thought there. Let's go to verse 1 of, of chapter 3. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Would their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Let God be true and every man a liar. Our ability to trust doesn't rely on men because we know that our God simply will not lie, cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Now, that's not because God's uh, got better willpower than we do and he just knows, well, I shouldn't tell a lie, so I'm just not going to tell a lie. I got to make sure he wakes up in the morning. Well, God never slumbers, so he... He has a realization at some point during these, his heavenly day, I shouldn't lie today. He's like, I've got to make sure I don't lie today. I've got to make sure I don't lie today. That's not how it works for God. If God said something, that means it's true. So if God said up was down, guess what? Whoop, everything switches. If God said black was white, if God said red was yellow, if God said east was west, it wouldn't matter to mom in any way. 
<laughs> Wouldn't change a thing for her. <laughs> but if God says something by virtue of who he is, then that becomes truth. So God can't lie. He can't. So if God be true, let everybody else, everything else you hear be a lie, including yourself, if it goes against what God says. That's the kind of trust that Jesus gave us when he was betrayed. Because Judas had probably said all along, I'm with you. His actions had said, I'm with you, Jesus. He was one of his 12. He was his servant. He was someone that Jesus washed his feet just a few days before he betrayed him. Or just, just before he betrayed him. Right. Hours after he had washed his feet, Judas betrayed him. Judas was stealing money from the, from the, from the till, from the, the, the money that they had. He had sticky fingers. Jesus was betrayed by someone who had claimed his allegiance to him, who had pledged loyalty to him. He was betrayed by him. He withstood that so we know that my God will never forsake me. He said to us, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What did Jesus, Judas do to him? Jesus left him and forsook him. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That second station of the cross where Jesus was betrayed redeemed our ability to trust. It gave us something that we could believe was true no matter what. No matter what, any, no matter what the preacher, priest, prophet, evangelist, anybody said, if it didn't line up with the word of God, we know that what the word of God is true. So if somebody tries to tell you you're nothing, nobody, non-important, non that you're, that you're a, a worm, that you're you know, undeserving of anything, we know the word of God doesn't tell us that, so we know that's not true. That's the trust we've been given. It doesn't matter. I don't care what initials are after that person's name, how big of a congregation they have, what channel they're on TV, or how many books they've sold. If they tell you that you're nothing and you're worthless, they're wrong. Period. And there are those out there who'll do it. You know why they do it? Because they need you to feel insecure, because as long as you're insecure, you need them. And that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to need only Him. All right? Sec or, I'm sorry, not second. The third station of the cross is he is condemned by the Sanhedrin. And we find that in Matthew 26 as well. Matthew 26, and we're going to pick it up in verse 59. Here we go, and it says, Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest, aro high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Then Jesus said, It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Now, that line Jesus gives him, he's like, You said it, but I don't think you said it right. And a lot of times when we read the accounts of Jesus, we have a wrong impression, I think. Uh, you guys have a wrong picture of Jesus in your head. I've got it pictured right. Okay? Uh, we've seen too many of the old school uh, faith movies where Jesus was very, you know, unassuming and, and uh, go with, you know, just, just very weak looking, his portrayal. I don't think so. Jesus, when he's, the, the, he's got all these people, they're supposedly his leaders. They are the religious leaders. They are the lawyers of the day, too. And they said, you said you're the son of God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the son of God. He says, hey, that's what you said. But if you want to really hear it right, not only am I the son of God, I'm, going to be, I'm the power of God. I'm seated at the right hand of God. The next time you see me, you're answering to me. And that freaked them out. And they just lost the guy's ripping his clothes and making a big show of things, all because Jesus told them the truth. And even the false witnesses that came against him, they said what he said. They just tried to disguise it as something else. Jesus did say, I will tear this temple down and rebuild it in three days. They didn't know what he was talking about, though. So to them, it was a lie. It was blasphemy. It was terrible. It was awful. It was worthy of death. Jesus, at this, I don't think he was back down a second against anybody. Not one second did he, was he the victim of anything. And I don't think he's a victim here either. 
I don't, I don't see him reciting. I don't get a line reading of Jesus being like, well, you know, that's what you said, but <sighs> let me compose myself. Let me get it together. Get it together, Jesus. When I come, when you see me next, I'm going to be someone important. That's not how he said it. I just threw, he threw it in their face because he knew what they were going to do. He knew what they were prophesied to do. He knew it was needed to happen. So I believe Jesus got his digs in, so to speak, when he could. Now, maybe you don't think of Jesus like that. But you're going to have a hard time recognizing him when he comes back then. Because he, he came here once as a carpenter. He's not coming back as a carpenter. Right. Not at all. He's coming here to kick donkey and take names. <laughs> yeah, get that t-shirt made. I'm here to kick donkey and take names, and I don't care about your name. <laughs> yeah, we'll have that be the Grace Fellowship of Grove and kicking donkey and taking names. Huh? And, tattooed. and tattooed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, today, religion rejects, rejects the concept that we are all sons of God. And be like, oh, no, well, that's pretty much what churches think that we're joining up. But how many churches believe women are sons of God? Very few. How many? I, I listen to conservative uh, podcasts, and there's one who's very, very well known who still thinks that it's sinful for a woman to be behind a pulpit. That's one thing the Catholic Church is not bent on in a lot of ways, is they don't believe that women can teach. My wife's taught me many things. She's taught me whether, you know, <laughs> anyway. I don't know, she, she can hear this. She's in the nursery, so it's not like before when she, she didn't hear. She's in the nursery down there, and she's got the TV on, so I want to be careful here. But, but my wife's taught me things. Pastor Deb has taught us things. There's a lot of great teachers in. Karen was teaching us, brought the word this morning for offering. And uh, we know there's lots of women here who've brought forth with grandma, Sheila, Dina. Every woman in here has probably given forth some kind of a, a teaching at some point. Amen. Diane's done something, I'm sure. <laughs> She's taught us to know how far, know how far uh, it doesn't matter how far along in life you go, there are still going to be people who, who sink as low as the root for the cowboys. It's a lesson that Sheila's learned as well. <laughs> we know that women can teach. Amen. We are, modern religion rejects the idea that we are all sons of God. Uh, with, with Matthew 27, flip over to Matthew 27 real quick, verse uh, 51. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went and appeared, it went into the holy city and appeared to many. That verse gets left out a lot of times when you talk about it. the dead people got up and walked around and met people. <laughs> That'd be fun to see. I think. <laughs> I think that'd be fun to see. Or a little, maybe a little scary. I don't think they're going to be like the walking dead, you know, the zombies. I don't think that's how they walked around. But maybe, I bet one of them did just because they had that kind of sense of humor. I'm not the only one who would think of something like that. There had to be somebody from back then who's like, okay, well, they all know that I've been dead for 25 years. Let's see if I can freak them out a little bit. <laughs> I think that'd be, that'd be the first thing I'd think of to do. I don't know, oh, the rest of you wouldn't. You'd just sit there and back like, oh, hello, nice to meet you. You wouldn't sneak up on your base. I saw what you did. <laughs> I was watching. <laughs> Nobody else would do that? That's just me? All right. <laughs> we, know that, we know that Christ is seated at the right hand of God the same way he said he would be, and we are seated with him. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, we're going to look at verse uh, 5. It says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kingdom towards us in Christ Jesus. He's raised us up with him, to sit with him, to show off that we're there. Your God's bragging. Bragging is a bad word. I'm sorry. But God is bragging on his children by elevating us to sit at a place where the religious leaders thought that even the Son of God shouldn't sit. Amen? Okay. 
Station number four. Oh, I'm sorry. We were redeemed and separated from religion. I apologize for that. I forgot to I have it in parentheses and I forgot my parenthetical and left it out. That's the only big word I'll use today. Parenthetical. Huh? Religion. From religion. Redeemed from religion. Uh, station number four. He is condemned by Pontius Pilate. Now we're not going to read through the whole account. We know very well. We're well aware of what happened with Pontius Pilate. He's brought home. Pilate said, I see no sin in him. He ships him off to Herod to try to pass the buck because he didn't want to deal with it because his wife had weird dreams. And uh, so he comes back to him. And finally, Pilate is finally forced. His hand is forced by the masses to condemn Jesus to die. It says that we have been... And uh, that redeems us because we are separated and redeemed from the world. It does not take a lot it does not, I'm sorry, it does not take a lot to look around and see the curse that the world is operating under. Amen? Am I the only one who sees it? You see the horrors that go on on a daily basis. The absolute, I can't imagine. I mean, look, there's time, I may have mentioned this before. I don't know if it was here or somewhere else or on something else. Maybe... There are times when it strikes me just how privileged my life is. Now, I know privilege is such a loaded political word nowadays. That's not what I mean. I was born in America to parents that love me. I was not born in the middle of a country constantly at war. I've never known starvation. I've never known destitution. I've never known what it was like to not know where I was going to sleep that night. I've never known abandonment. I've never known true, hopeless loneliness before. I've never been one day of my life thinking that there wasn't somebody somewhere who cared about me. Not once have I experienced any of that. And for 75% of the world's population, that's a daily thing. Not knowing when my next meal is going to come. Look at me. <laughs> I've not missed many meals. Amen. And, shh. <laughs> I've never known hunger. Not real hunger. Munchies, sure. I skipped lunch, sure. You know, I've been on fast before. I don't like them. If it wasn't in the Bible, I'd say they were not of God. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to convince me of that if it wasn't in the Word. But I've never known, I've never, I don't know what it's like to have, to be taken into slavery. What if I'd have been born in this country 200 years ago and black? You know, I can't imagine what it's like to, from birth to death to be owned by another human being. But for black, white, yellow, brown, throughout all the world, slavery has been a constant of human existence up until recent history. And it still goes on now. I can't imagine to be a young woman who's kidnapped and forcibly addicted to drugs and sent out to be, a, to be prostituted against her will. I can't imagine what that's like. I can't imagine what it's like to live like that. I can't imagine what it's like to live right now in the Ukraine or in the Congo or in Burma, or in all these, any of these other places where the daily life is filled with such brutality that they, we wouldn't be able to, we can't even show it on TV in America. I can't imagine what that's like. That world, to what I have to live in that, I've been so blessed with where I am in life that sometimes, I don't know if it's like a survivor's guilt or something else that comes on because I just feel like it's not, I didn't do anything to earn it. It's, I, never, I didn't do anything special to have parents that loved me and not, didn't abandon me. But I did. But here I am. And when Jesus was condemned by Pontius Pilate, flip over to Romans 12 too. So I lost track of where I was at for a second, but Romans, because it does, it just, I have those moments of realization of just how good we've got it here in this country. You know? If you make, I mean, if you're just above the poverty level, in America, you're richer than 90% of the rest of the world. 
95, probably 95 percent of the rest of the world. We live in unimaginable wealth to what most of the world thinks of. No matter how much you have here, even if you're just barely making it and you feel like you've got nothing, take account of what you set your hands on every day. I have a house with multiple bedrooms. My family has more than one car. We have indoor plumbing, electricity, air conditioning, heat. We have a refrigerator, stove, microwave. There are no fewer than five TVs in my house. We have internet access. We have jobs. We have schools that our kids can go to. We have enough money for clothes, food, and entertainment. The rest of the world thinks that's a fantasy. Not a big chunk of the world thinks that that's a fantasy. They can't comprehend living that well. I don't know what that's, that's supposed to do or serve any point in this, but there it is. Uh, when he's condemned in Romans 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have been redeemed from this world. We don't have to live like that. We don't have, now, it's, it's, I think it's important to remember our blessings. To thank God for the things that he's done for us. But also to live in such a way and to let our lives be such a way that people that are not as fortunate as we've been to start with, they can get there. Because the word of God is true in Illinois and in Africa. The word of God is true in Morton and Beijing. The word of God is true in this church. And the word of God is still true in every Muslim church, every Buddhist temple, and every Satanist temple, every synagogue across the world. The word of God is still true there. They may not be hearing it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to them. The Word of God applies to anybody who will apply the Word of God. So we, we're supposed to be God's way of showing off to the rest of the world. That's why we're here. That's why we've been blessed. That's why we're so fortunate. So that somebody who lives in abject poverty, poverty halfway across the world will see us and have proof in their eyes that our God is the one and true God. Amen. That's a responsibility we have. Amen? We've been separated from this world, redeemed from this world because of Jesus being condemned by this world and Pontius Pilate. Station number five, Jesus is beaten. Uh, go, to Matthew, go back to Matthew 26 again. Section, uh, station five is a two-part. There's an A and B. He's bruised and he's whipped. Matthew 26 Look at verse 68. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Look at verse 67 first. Then they spat in his face. Oh. It's going to take an audible voice from heaven for me not to punch somebody who spits in my face. <laughs> There's no greater disrespect. I mean, now in post-COVID, can you imagine what would happen if somebody spit in your face? People would be, ah, they fall down and start shaking. <laughs> so, uh, spitting in my face, that's a one-way ticket to us fighting. Um, thank God I can be forgiven, and I'll, be, I'm a, I'll eventually get to the point where, where that's not going to be that. I won't have to act like that, but if I'm being completely honest to you right now, if you walk up and spit in my face today, you're getting punched. I'll feel bad about it. <laughs> I'll realize afterwards that uh, I shouldn't have done that, but we'll deal with that afterwards. <laughs> But anyway, Jesus, uh, here, uh, I'm not Jesus, thank God. Uh, then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? <laughs> These people, I hope, if they, they obviously probably lived longer than Jesus. I really hope those people found him. Because they're going to be the happiest people in heaven, along with Judas. <laughs> and, uh, because they're going to they'll get to they'll get to see Jesus knowing what they how disrespectful, how hard was it for her to hold back? How how difficult must have been for him to sit there and let that to be smacked in the face, and mocked and ridiculed? He knew who, and the thing is he could have answered. He said, "Yeah, that was you." You know what else you did? You hit so and so ten years ago. You did this, blah blah blah. He could have rattled off their entire life, sto life story to him, and he didn't. He stayed silent. He was bruised. Bruising, nurses, back me up on this, is actually technically bleeding. Bruising is bleeding that occurs with the spilling of blood inside the body. That's, you're bleeding technically. Uh, whipping. We know from Isaiah 53.5 that he was 
wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Uh, if you go over to Matthew 27, verse 26. And he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Jesus was whipped. We've heard Pastor Deb gave you know, a good account of that last week about the beating he took with the whip. But he was punched and spat and, and beaten also. He's bleeding inside and out. And we know what those, those strives for. I'm not reinventing the wheel. This, this was our healing. This, this bought our healing. This redeemed us from infirmity. So his, his, he's beaten. But what I, I thought is interesting is he was bleeding on the outside and the inside. And I think that there's a lot of inner hurts that are just as painful as outer hurts. And just as hard to heal. I think that inner bleeding speaks to those. That bruising. Man, sometimes I need to be healed of a bruised ego too. Nobody amen. <laughs> <laughs> Not one. <laughs> When you think you're doing it right and you're doing it wrong, doesn't that kind of messes your ego a little bit? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> there is no feeling on earth that I've experienced yet. Well, that's not true. That's, that's exaggeration. One of the worst feelings I ever feel is when I am proved to be wrong on something. <laughs> it rarely, rarely ever happens. So it's, it's, it's it, 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 you know, uh, it stands out in my memory. When I've been proven wrong on something, that's a, rough, that's a tough pill to swallow for me. <laughs> I'd, rather be, I'd rather get beaten than get proven wrong. But uh, there's been times I've been proven wrong. And God heals me of that because all that is is pride interfering with what God has said. That's taking what God said about me and making it about me and not about him. Saying it, I did it by my work, by my strength, when we know that Without him, I can do nothing. But through him, I can do everything, anything. So sometimes I need to be reminded of that. But after I've been reminded, you know, it's like uh, with kids. You know, Phoenix is, well, she's a lot. <laughs> and parenting is a young man's game. <laughs> I'm 48 years old. All right? She's 18 months. She's got more energy than I thought. That, I thought Zeke was bad. <laughs> this girl, I swear to you, it's like she has everything. You ever seen like the, she got the, 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 they scan, the, like the, she's got a scanner. She's like scanning the room for possibilities to annoy dad. <laughs> and so I'll pick one out. I'll find it like, oh, I left that on the table within a reach. I got to grab that. So I'll go to grab that. And I forget that I left something over here. So as soon as she sees me, goes for that, she went for that to fake me out and set me up because she didn't want that. What she wanted was the thing I was abandoning over here. So as soon as I grab this and get out of the way, she's onto that. If we have... We have no chairs around our kitchen table. Okay? We have to hide the chairs. We have no chairs around our kitchen table. Because she will climb on the chair and get on the table. I'm 48 years old. I'm not getting up off the couch every time I tell her, don't climb on the chair. And she looks at me, smiles, says, hi, daddy, and climbs onto the table. <laughs> That's 25, 30 times an hour. I'm not doing it. It's easier to hide the chairs. We have no, you can't come over and sit down at our table right now without forward notice. We have to plan on sitting in our house. We have, to keep, we have to keep the bathroom door closed because that's where we keep the litter box. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know, where was I going with that? But when I, when I discipline her or tell her no, you know, she's, she, she'll get her our little lip will quiver and I just, I'm like, oh, I don't care what you did. Come here. I love you. <laughs> so I ruin it. <laughs> I'm a terrible father because as soon as I tell her no and then she gets upset, I pick her up like, I love you and I play with her and I try to make her smile again and I feel so bad. But so after, after, you know, you do something like, I, I know where I was going now is if like when I have my ego bruised because I thought I was doing something right and I got into pride and I get knocked off that God's right there to be like, I still love you. Amen. That's what he does. So that's redeemed the healing from those inner inner healings, those inner healings, are the same as the physical ones that we're all believing for, for Bennett, for Rob Folk, for Phoenix, for all those names that are on that list. This is where it comes from. But Jesus was beaten. He paid the price for those things already. It's like going to the doctor and they say, well, how will you be paying today? He said, I've already paid. 
it's already been paid. Right? Or, to put it in terms that, you know, that I'm more familiar with, when I call ahead to Pizza Hut, and I pull up to the window, they say, how are you paying? Well, I already paid. So just give me the pizza, and we're going to go on our way. It's been prepaid. Just like your pizza when you, mail it, when you do it on the app. So you get points. I'm not alone, am I? No? no? Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, we need to hurry this up. Uh, station six, the crown of thorns. John 19, verse 1. John 19, verse 1. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Again, just a humiliation. But the crown of thorns, they did it to mock him. Right? Look, the king won his crown. They were speaking the truth. I've always thought this is an interesting spot in this story. Because in their desire to ridicule him, their desire to mock him, their desire to belittle him, to punish him, to make him look bad, to embarrass him, to humiliate him, and to, to, uh, to crush his spirit, when faced with Jesus Christ, they could speak nothing but the truth. Here is the king of the Jews. Okay, it didn't, didn't affect you the same way it affected me, obviously, but it affected me. I thought that was interesting that in that moment, as they tried to crush him. Who he was could not be denied. He was Jesus, the king of the Jews. A crown signifies a king. A king is a lord and master of all that is within his domain. Flip over to Psalms 24. Psalms 24, verse 1, says this, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So that crown that they put on his head, making him a king, a king has complete control and owns everything within his domain. Psalms 24 tells us that his domain is basically everything. It's everything, right? The earth and the fullness thereof, including the people on it. So they crowned him king of the Jews. What they were showing us is that they had crowned him king of the world, and all the riches in this world belong to him. All the glory in this world belongs to him. All the people in this world belong to him. Every mountain, every hill, every mine, every cave, every river, every stream, every ocean, every single place on this planet belongs to Jesus. So when they put a crown on his head, they, they signified that that was his. And guess what? He's given it all to us. So the crown of thorns redeemed us from poverty and bestowed on us prosperity. Because we are one with Christ. Amen? Amen? Station number seven. Jesus is stripped of his garments. Go to John 19. Are you guys okay with this so far? Amen. I know it's a lot. It's a lot of flipping back and forth. A lot of verses, but I think it's important for us to remember these things. And as we're actually on Easter Sunday, again today, I think it's important to go back and revisit them. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made into four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one place. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lot for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, we have seen so many movies that represent the crucifixion of Jesus, and every single one of them is wrong on one aspect. When you are crucified, you are shamed as well as tortured. So Jesus was not crucified with a loincloth. Jesus was crucified completely naked. And, I mean, that, that's, that's adding insult to injury, especially in cultures where that's considered, you know, you just don't do that. You don't see other people naked in that, in that culture. 
it's, it's shameful in that culture for that to happen. But that's what they did to him. And in front of all those people, this great prophet man of God, to be stripped and shamed and have the soldiers there gambling over his stuff while he's in agony. Stripped of his garments, redeemed us from shame. He was stripped of his garments so that we could be clothed in righteousness. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, and we're going to look at verse 10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, and the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. He was stripped so that we could be clothed in righteousness and glory. I mean, he was shamed so that we could go around unashamed. Ephesians 4. Let's go flip over and see a new... Ephesians 4, verse 24. Oh, i got to hurry. All right. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Two parts of that, real quick. Righteousness and holiness. Only one of those things depends on you. You've been made righteous, it's your choice to live holy. You put on holiness because you're righteous. You don't get righteousness because you're holy. You don't earn it. You can't earn it. You can't do it. But you, because you're righteous, you put on holiness. Does that make sense? Holiness is about what you do. Righteousness is about who you are. Amen? Okay. Uh, say, say, station number eight and nine are linked. They are station eight, his hands are nailed. Station nine, his feet are nailed. Uh, those redeem us, well, they, 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 they promote us to dominion over what we touch and where we walk. His hands were restrained against the wood. Our hands have been made free to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Our hands have been free so that God can bless the works of those hands. Amen? That's what he bought from us. He redeemed our hands and our feet to, to stand in dominion. Everywhere our feet steps, we have dominion. Uh, Joshua 1.3. Joshua 1, verse 3. You know what? Let's, I keep doing this. I jump on a verse that has the actual words in it. I forget sometimes that there's a verse leading into it. So jump up to Joshua 2. Joshua verse, chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to you, to give to them, the children of Israel. This is the Lord speaking to Joshua. And verse 3 says, every, play, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. He's done the same thing for us. We're under a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises. Everywhere we go, we have dominion. Pastor Bob has taught on this over and over and over again. Everywhere he goes, he takes peace with him. He can go work on a psych ward with crazy people. He takes peace with him. Why? Because he has dominion where he stands. Amen? You have dominion everywhere you go. The Bible tells you as much as it depends on you. You'll live at peace with all people. So that means you have a choice to make. As much as it depends. Now, you can't control somebody else. If they hate you, they hate you. As much, but where you go, you take peace. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. Amen? So where your feet go, you have dominion to do what God's told you to do. Because you don't get abandoned just because you walk someplace. You're not leaving God behind when you walk out of the church. You're not abandoning your, your position because you leave the house. If, wherever you go, you take God with you. Again, it's the difference between righteousness and holiness. If you go someplace you're not supposed to go, guess what? You're taking God with you. Do you want him there? Does he want to be there? Probably not. Amen? All right. I'm sure that, I see that moved you. 
You understand there's probably places you're not supposed to go? I'm not talking about all the sinful places. Maybe God told you to be someplace, somewhere, when he wanted you there, and you're not there. You're someplace you're not supposed to go. He didn't want you there. Get back where he wanted you. Amen? Right, Hank? You're supposed to be driving on the road, not off the road. You drive off the road, you meet Hank. <laughs> and when you meet Hank, it's a little expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Dominion over what we touch, dominion over where we walk. Those are stations eight and nine. Station number 10, Jesus pardons the thief. Luke 23. Luke 23, and we're going to look at verse 39. Then one of the criminals who blasphemed, or one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This guy was able to see, and here we have a story of two different men, both experiencing the same agony, both experiencing the same results for what they'd done. They both lived similar lives. They were both criminals, low lives. They were people you would not want around you. One of them saw Christ and was moved to curse. The other saw Christ and was, remo- and was moved to humility. He didn't even know that Jesus had done nothing wrong, but he could see it on him. Amen? His heart, his heart was in a place where it wasn't as hardened as the other man's heart was. I've broken a law or two. I have. A couple of decent-sized ones. <laughs> it's not just throwing gum on the sidewalk or not returning a shopping cart, but I'm talking about, I've got, there's a couple of them that, that they have record of me breaking now. <laughs> there are file cabinets who remember who I am. Okay? I come up on a good, what? <laughs> I'm talking about who? Rob Martin, that, that guy, yeah. But uh, yeah, you can find evidence of it, <laughs> it's out there. But I never developed a hard heart that would cause me to see Jesus and reject him. There are prisons in this, there are a lot of prisons in this country. For a lot of people. Not every single person in that prison is a reprobate. We think of them that way, if we think of them at all, which that's another sermon. But there are people in prison whose hearts have been turned to God. And they still, like the thief on the, the one thief on the cross, have accepted his salvation, but are still in that place. It's a question of your heart. Uh, what I also liked about this, this, this thief that, that saw Jesus, recognized him, says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Didn't ask him for anything else, just to be remembered. And Jesus said, you'll be in paradise with me today. Today. Is that guy baptized? Did he say a sinner's prayer? Did he walk down an aisle? Did he kneel, shake and cry? Anything like that? What did he do? He proclaimed Jesus as Lord, believed on him, and he was saved. What does the Bible say? Those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What does it mean to be saved? That you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He believed that Jesus was Lord. He knew that Jesus was God's Son. He believed on him, and he was in paradise that same day. He still had to die the rest of the day on the cross. He still had to have his legs broke when the storm came, so that he would die faster on the cross. But in that state, he still knew where he was going. No matter what he had done with his life up to that point, it didn't matter. He was the first person in heaven. Jesus pardoned that thief and gave us the promise of salvation. It redeemed us from sin. It showed us that our salvation was true no matter what we had been before. 
Now, I'm not saying you're not supposed to get baptized. The Bible says get baptized. You're supposed to be baptized. But I don't think just because you're not baptized, you don't get to go to heaven. I don't see that. Because a thief did not get baptized. Now, you are, it's an act of obedience, and if you don't get baptized, you're, in, you're starting off your Christianity, your Christian walk, in disobedience. The Bible's very clear. Repent and be baptized. But we get so caught up, because then people get caught up, well, are you supposed to be dunked or sprinkled? Are you supposed to be half drowned like Pentecostals do? You know, some Pentecostal preacher, they hold you under. You're going to get baptized today. <laughs> you're going to know it. Legs start kicking, start shaking. See little bubbles coming up from the water. Uh, Pastor Bob tried to drown a little girl in Mapleton. <laughs> Almost lost control of her when she went under. <laughs> she did not want to go. <laughs> I've seen that before. It's, you know, or you just, if, you know, but if you're sprinkled, you're still just as baptized as if you've been held under for a minute. Amen? Oh, we don't like that one, huh? You are baptized. Baptized, how you define baptized is up to you. You're in obedience. If you think baptized is being sprinkled and you're in obedience as I'm supposed to be baptized, guess what? You're baptized. It's a question of the heart. Baptized signifies dying and coming back from the dead out of the grave. But you're going to tell me that there's a Catholic somewhere who believes God and everything in their heart has lived their entire life uh, under the impression that they were, they were baptized, and now that you're going to tell me that they technically weren't baptized because they weren't baptized how you thought they were supposed to be baptized, so that means their whole life is nothing and they're going to hell? I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. I'm sorry. You're going to have to give me lots of scripture to prove that to me. Okay. All right. Oh. We've got to get through four and ten minutes, so stop interrupting me with these great, big, amazing things that I have to say. All right? All these super important you know, interesting things that I have to say. And stop it, because we've got to get through. Uh, station number 11, Jesus thirsts. John 19, 28 through 30. It says he's on the cross. It says he said, I thirst. They give him sour wine, which is basically vinegar to drink. And uh, the reason Jesus said that, go to Matthew 5, 6. For one thing, it's to give us, look, this maybe this is how my mind works. I love when I see things in the Bible that I know that science can't disprove. And one of the first things you're going to see about crucifixion when you think about it is the idea that you're going to become dehydrated. And that there was, there's accounts of people in other, from other sources recounting crucifixion. And the one that I remember, I don't remember the guy's name or the exact circumstances. I remember the, the, the story because it spoke to this verse right here where Jesus said, I thirst. He was a very strong man. He was once, he was some kind of a revolutionary or had, you know, defied Rome. And when they crucified him, he never complained, cried out, begged for mercy, anything. The only thing that broke him on the cross was when, he, when thirst hit him. After the thirst hit him, that's when he broke. I remember the account of that. They talked about how it wasn't the, blood, it wasn't the nails that broke him. It wasn't the beating that broke him. It was the thirst. There was a river that ran nearby, and he began to beg people to bring him water from that, from that stream. And that's what broke him, finally broke his spirit. So when Jesus says, I thirst, then it reminds, it reminds me of that, and I, it gives me that historical context of what crucifixion would be like. Because we have, we have only one that I'm aware of, piece of physical evidence that anybody's ever been crucified before. There's only one thing on, that I've heard of that is a physical evidence of crucifixion happening. We have accounts of it throughout all of the known world. The Sumerians did it. The Assyrians did it. We know the Romans perfected it. We only have one archaeological thing that proves crucifixion happened, and that's a human heel with a nail head still in it that was found at a, at a, uh, at a site. Other than that, we have no physical evidence of crucifixion happened. So I love things like this that show, that bring that, that evidence forth, because I think the Bible's true. And I like it when it's proven out that way. Matthew 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I believe that Jesus thirsting redeemed us from, it gave us the, uh, the thirst for knowledge and the thirst for righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, seek out who we are. We were redeemed from not knowing who we are. We were, we were promoted to a knowledge of what God's made us, who we are in Christ. I said that inartfully. We were promoted to knowledge of who we are. Because we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. So Jesus thirsting redeemed us from not being able to sate that thirst in ourselves. Amen? Okay. Number 12. We all know this one. Jesus dies on the cross. We all agree that happened, right? We have as much evidence of Jesus dying on the cross that we have Socrates ever lived. More, actually. 
We have just as much evidence that Jesus died on the cross that we have that Muhammad lived. We have just as much evidence that Jesus died on the cross as we know of any historical person. We have four separate accounts. Four eyewitnesses that have written it down and those writings have stayed on through oral tradition until they were written down on the paper of this event. This event absolutely happened. No reasonable scholar claims that Jesus didn't live and that Jesus wasn't crucified. That's accepted everywhere. We know why Jesus died on the cross, right? He redeemed us from sin. His life bought ours. He wasn't killed on the cross. Let's make that clear. He died on the cross. He was not killed. We often hear about uh, well, what actually caused Jesus to die. You know, how, how do you die from crucifixion? Well, it eventually gets you. It's usually asphyxiation. Because you get to the point where you don't have the muscle strength to raise your body up. Because the way you're crucified, your feet are nailed, your arms are nailed, and you have to kind of raise up to take a breath because the weight of your body continues to pull you down. And so it gets to the point where that weight constricts your lungs, so you have to raise up in order to take a breath in great pain in both your feet and your hands, your back scraping against that wood. And you would eventually, if you imagine, just try standing with your knees bent for a few minutes and see what happens. Your muscles, your legs are going to start to shake. You're going to have muscle cramps. He would have had cramps throughout his entire body. In his back, in his shoulders, in his arms. His hands were pierced through. There's a nerve that runs through here. It goes all the way up and causes intense pain. Um, I have right, something going on with one of the nerves up in my neck now that causes my left arm to just hurt sometimes randomly. And uh, so I, I, it's nothing as serious as what he went through, but it reminds me that nothing down here is wrong. But because there's an issue up here, this hurts. So he would have pain all over his body, and he would not be able to breathe. So that's how people die. Or, you know, like what happened here, they would break the legs of the people on the cross as a mercy almost to them, so that they would die faster, because then they physically couldn't lift up to breathe. None of that killed Jesus. They didn't kill Jesus. Jesus was not killed by crucifixion. He died, but he was not killed. Go to John. I'm not just, you know, making too much out of simple words. I want you to pay attention real close to this part. John 10, verse 15 says, As my Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay, my, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Crucifixion didn't kill Jesus. Jesus chose to die after everything had been accomplished. That's why he said, it is finished. He had done what he needed to do. There was no point in hanging on that cross. For one more second, he died. No, you can't just sit there. If anybody could die on the cross like that, everybody would do it. If you could just say, that's it, I'm done, I'm out, then everybody would do that. Everybody that's ever been crucified would have done that. Jesus wasn't killed by the whips. Jesus wasn't killed by the nails. Jesus wasn't killed by the crown of thorns. He wasn't killed by the beatings. He wasn't killed by asphyxiation. He wasn't killed by exposure. He wasn't killed by blood loss. He wasn't killed by any of those things. He endured all those things for all the things that we just talked about so he could fulfill each and every aspect of what salvation means to us. And then he said, I'm done, and he left. Now, we read the Bible, we think, even in the movies, we see it wrong because we see him saying, and, you know, he's trying to catch his breath, and he says, it is finished, and dies. That's not how he said it. He said he said it in a loud voice. Jesus says, that's it, I'm out, and went to heaven, or to hell. Went to hell, and, and released everybody in hell, de de defeated hell and death, and then arose back from the dead, and then would go on to sit at his father. He didn't sit there and whisper it. It wasn't murmured. It was with a loud voice that broke the ground, that split the veil, and that he reunited man with God. And that was not because, he was stronger in that moment than he had been through any point of his walk on earth, and it was after they beat him. It was after they whipped him. It was after they nailed him to the cross. He stood up with a loud voice, said, I'm done. That settles it. And it was gone. That's right. That's right. He didn't have to wait to die for that to be fulfilled. He chose when he died. Right. He chose when he was going to go. He chose which way he was going to go. And he went out like the king that he is. 
I did what I needed to do. That's it. They couldn't see if he had had to wait to die. That means that it was his death was in the control of somebody else. It was in control of his physical body. It was control of his tormentors. It was in control of the Romans or the, the, the religious leaders that delivered him up. It wasn't. None of that was up to them. It was all up to him. He decided when he went. He decided when he was going to go. And he went out with a bang. Yes. Amen. I believe he said it loud enough that it scared every person there. I don't have proof of that, but he says he cried out with a loud voice, which is not what somebody does who's been hanging on a cross for hours, who has to force himself to lift to breathe. In that moment, when it was finished, it was done. His pain was done. Everything had been accomplished. He did what he had to do. There was no point in him waiting to die at that point, because that means it was up to someone else. He decided. It was God's command for him to decide when he died. <clears throat> he, we were redeemed from sin in that moment. He was not done redeeming us after he was dead, I believe. John 19, verse 32. We're, close, we're, we're almost done. We're almost done. I'm sorry. I got, give me five more minutes. I'm sorry. I told you not to let me go off on all these other tangents. You guys are supposed to keep me in line. I need five more minutes. <clears throat> the 13th station of the cross, his side is pierced. John 19, 32. And it says, Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. His side was pierced, so that we could be pierced with joy. They, they, wouldn't, they had to make sure he was dead. So they pierced the side and blood and water flowed. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure how water got into it. I've heard some people talk about that there's an area around the heart that in that level of stress would build up with fluid that would be considered water that was built up around the heart and the pericar pericardi. There it is. And that, that when they pierced his heart, it hit both of them. And so blood and water came out at that same time. And the amount of stress and pressure that he was under throughout that entire day is justifiable. You would see that that, that kind of build up would have happened. That's how I think it happened naturally. I don't know. I wasn't there, and I'm not a doctor. But I know that because his side was pierced, we have our joy restored. We have joy in knowing that everything he did, once that put every, because after he said it is finished, he could have just looked dead. Nobody's going to get up there with a stethoscope and check him, right? Right? I mean, he could have just been, a, he could have just been passed out. He could have been unconscious, into a coma from the blood loss. We don't know. But once they stuff a, shoved a spear in his side and pierced his heart, they knew he was dead. That's how they were showing that he was dead. So we have joy that it's been accomplished, that everything is done. Uh, this final station of the cross, of this travel, this travail sets up the next one. Now I said there's 14, I've added a 15th, which is just, it's not a station of the cross, but it's a result of all of it. So station 14 is his body is laid in a tomb. We know that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a follower, a disciple of Jesus, uh, petitioned Pilate for the body. He was given the body, laid it in a, new, in a tomb. And uh, we know that this gives us, redeems us from death. Because Jesus came out of that tomb. He rose up out of that grave. He defeated death and hell while his body laid in that tomb. And so we've been given victory over death. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I don't think my kids, I think my kids see him return. That's my belief. I believe it happens in their lifetime. I don't know about my lifetime. I've been given no word on it. I have no prophecy on it. I just think that we're around that time. So I don't think my kids die of natural causes. I think they're taken up, which is a comforting thought. I don't know if I am in that same position or not. Doesn't matter. I'm getting there one way or the other. If I get to come out of the ground, I hope I have one split second to be like, hey, I saw what you did to somebody. So... <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the twinkling of an eye, so it's going to have to be fast. <laughs> but we can all have hopes and dreams, right? <laughs> His body being laid in the tomb to come out of the tomb gives us victory over death, which gives me the 50, with the resurrection. The resurrection is the end of all this. It's the result of all this. It's what we celebrate Easter for, no matter when we, how we figure out what day it's on. It's, if it, if, you know, it's completely arbitrary, like, you know, a regular calendar where it's just the same, you know, April 22nd every year. 
like we do Christmas. Christmas, we don't believe Jesus was born in December either. I have no understanding that this is actually when Jesus was raised from the dead or this is when we commemorate it. It doesn't matter. Because of all the things we just talked about, that's what's important. And you know what's great is not knowing the exact day that we're celebrating. It could be any day. Every day is Resurrection Sunday. Because every day we live with the, with the uh, benefits of everything that we talked about here. Every single time he, these stations, every single time he spilled, he spilled his blood, we get to have that every day. We can celebrate that every day. Even the mundane days. Even Monday. Which Mondays are usually not fun. But even on Mondays, we have Resurrection Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and every Sunday that we gather together, we get to celebrate Resurrection Sunday because of all the things that he did for us. Because of those seven places where he shed his blood. Because of those 14 spots that we've I've arbitrarily come up with to commemorate his journey through that time. We celebrate all of them. And we keep them as a memorial in our hearts. And if we remember them, we memorialize them. And when we memorialize them, we celebrate them. When we celebrate them, we teach our children to celebrate them. We teach new believers to celebrate them. To understand that it wasn't just about getting to heaven. He could have been killed in an instant and got us to heaven. Because all he had to do was die. But he wanted to redeem everything about us, not just our eternity. Because we were made to live here. We weren't created for heaven. I think we misunderstand that a lot. Man was made to live on earth. That's how God intended it. Now, that's why Jesus said, I got to go prepare a place for you guys because now you're redeemed and we got no place for you. You weren't supposed to be in heaven. Now we got to make a space in heaven for you. You're supposed to live here forever and never die. But, but then women. And so, uh, we'll end on that note. <laughs> You've been redeemed from every single thing that afflicts you. Every single thing that speaks against you. Every single thing that calls you out. Everything that puts you under. Everything that tells you you're not worthy. Everything that tells you you're not enough. Everything that tells you the wrong age. The wrong skin color. The wrong gender. All those things come up against the, the fact that these things that Jesus did for us redeemed us from everything that would ever try to come against us. No matter what. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right.